portions Chukat and Balak. And we're focusing mostly on um, the dark spiritual forces that we encounter in the portion of Balak when Balak, the destroyer, teams up with Bilam. And in years past, we've dissected uh, not just Balak as destroyer, which is pretty straightforward, but Bilam and where he came from, because that contributes to our, our view of the dynamics that are going on. We're not gonna go over that this year. Uh, I'm trying to get those uh, past videos uploaded as fast as I can so that eventually you'll have a complete library going back a few years where you can pull those old things out. And if you want to look for something specific, you'll be able to. So keep an eye on open for that on the, the link emails that I'm going to start putting in there, the link to the actual playlist for the private Torah class. And that should open the door for you to be able to look at that complete library. Um, I've made it all the way back. Now I'm ready to start uploading Bereshit. But I've done Vaikra and I've done Shemot. So we're, we're getting there gradually. All right, uh, let's continue. And like I told last night's class, for those who haven't uh, been with us um, prior to 2019, I'm listing here the links, which you will be able to get off that uh, private Torah class YouTube playlist, where you can go back and pull these two videos, uh, because I've taught this the first time in the context of Vayakel. There were two important symbols, the Mishkan and the Menorah, that play into Yeshua's teaching on the evil eye. And so I taught it the first time from that context. Then I enlarged upon it in a section of 50,000 degrees and cloudy in an unabridged and as yet unpublished version of 50,000 degrees and cloudy that's for a much more advanced student like we're doing in these Monday and Tuesday classes. A little harder for the general public. Um, and those links will also be on your, your link email when you get those today. All right, so we're um, going back to these fiery serpents and so forth in the wilderness where they journeyed from a boat, which is that place. Uh, I think it was the stupid question of sorcery where we, we talked more about what really occurs at a boat because you have the choice of two directions, consult, consulting the dead and the realm of the unclean, or consulting your fathers and mothers in faith, the avot, the avot. So avot, avot, that's the choice. And of course we know in this particular Torah portion that the camping there um, was marked by uh, this unpleasant incident in the, the wilderness of Tzin, where because of further misbehavior, the serpents begin to strike. And there's a vote, that's one view. Um, then I did show a video last night of an, a drone view so that you could get a full picture. Um, so let's go right here. I think this is about where we stopped. We're talking about the evil eye because we had contexts for Bilam referring to his eyes. And we talked about the different ways that prophets can access prophecy through dreams and visions, or uh, in another context, riddles and dark sayings, versus how Moses received prophecy, which was mouth to mouth, eye to eye, face to face. And whether we want you know, to agree with it or not, the implication there is that the clearest, most direct prophecy we have in scripture is the first five books of the Bible. And everything else has to be seen through that lens because anything else that was seen through a different prophet or recorded by another prophet was seen through a different sort of prism. Um, dream, vision, riddle, parable, dark saying, whatever. So um, the more we learn the Torah, 
the more we're accessing the face-to-face -face message rather than through the lens of a prophet. And we talked about some of the pitfalls of prophecy last night. So let's continue on as we're looking at this evil eye that Yeshua taught about in the, the Gospels. He taught about it, so it must be important. And we know also that many pagan cultures are fixated on the evil eye. It really is a thing. Um, but again, your perception of it. What is your lens? And our lens is going to be the Torah and some things that Yeshua teaches us out of the Gospels for handling the evil eye. Um, just kind of using that play on words, we don't have to ward off the evil eye, we have to word off the evil eye because it is related to covetousness, which is one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet. And we can see that in Balak, the destroyer, his interest was the fees of divination. And in spite of the warning, he presses on because he wants those fees. He wants the, he wants the loot. He wants the money. And uh, we know Balak, his evil eye, there's two kinds of evil eyes that the rabbis describe. One is going to be based on covetousness. And what, we're going to look at the root of covetousness. Where, do, where does that come from? But there's another type of evil eye that Balak has, which is an eye of destruction looking at things with a, a preset of how can I destroy this? Because his, they're cousins. Those, those two types of evil eyes, they're not disconnected. They really are cousins. Whereas one type might see, well, let me acquire that thing. With Balak, his, his method might be different. It might be to destroy the thing that he's cast his eye upon. But in general, we know that the evil eye is usually seen as coveting. And that word for it to covet, chamad, um, um, it's used frequently in modern Hebrew, like chamud would be pleasant. Uh, if you wanna call someone sweetie pie, you would say chamudi. Uh, but it means to delight in the beauty of something something that is greatly beloved and favored, uh, something to be desired, something that is delectable. And so when we are coveting something, we are attracted to its desirable qualities. Um, it's endearing to us. There's something about it that's delectable and delicious that makes us covet it. And we've all coveted something that was desirable to us. In fact, we're told to earnestly covet the better gifts. What's the difference? Well, when you covet on the bad side of the thing, there's, there's things that are desirable. And so chamad is not necessarily a bad word, it's a good word. But what's your motive for coveting? If you simply covet it because someone else has it and it's not yours, that's where you edge over into the realm of the negative use of chamad or covetousness. It's forbidden to you because it belongs to someone else. That's coveting. Uh, but should you earnestly desire gifts to do things in the kingdom, to be more useful to the Father? Sure, that sort of... Uh, desire, um, that's a good, that's a good thing. It's a contronym, just like every other Hebrew word. So this, I think, helps us unpack the difference between the two types of evil eye. We know that Balaam is, even though he tries desperately <laughs> to curse Israel, he cannot. And he keeps telling Balak, I can't do this. As much as I want the money, I cannot do this. And if he knows, if Balak knows that Balaam's going to be unable to curse Israel, if he's thinking, he might say, okay, well, he can't curse Israel, but what if I ask him to bless me? Maybe that would just produce a state of stasis where nothing bad is going to happen. One is going to kind of offset the other. If he'll just bless me, in addition to blessing them, then we'll both have a blessing and then maybe they won't 
you know, come and, and get me. Because it's it's interesting that we've they extended an invitation to to Edom or a request, please let us pass through, and Edom comes out with the sword. So their cousins there, their Abrahamic cousins, have not been so welcoming. And then through Lot, we have the Moabites, the descendants of Lot. So they're distant Abrahamic cousins. They don't come out with the sword, but they want to come out with the curse. Um, it's a little bit different tack. And so Balak, it doesn't occur to him, well, at least bless me, where we can just bring this thing to a standstill and it might protect me that way. Uh, he just wants to destroy any way that he can destroy. Of course, we know that he used the Moabite women uh, to seduce the Israelite men. So while Bilam seems to be attracted to the, the business of sorcery by his greed, coveting the goods and the high regard of others, we know that he loves the nice addresses and uh, being revered for all his you know, professional work and cursing and all that. Um, but he does covet the goods and the high regard of others. So it's not just to look at the things other people have. It's also to look at the favor or the blessings that other people are experiencing and coveting them because they're not yours. And it goes, it plays very nicely on our previous lesson, which was Korah. He wanted the position, he wanted the leadership, he was greedy, and uh, he wanted what was not his. And so it's the same way here. With Bilam, you see that, that sort of motivation, I want the stuff. Balak's motivation is, I just want to totally destroy this threat against me. So we can see, again, two men who, even though they have different agendas, they have their individual agendas. One is destruction, and one is seeking favor and power, among others. What binds them together is a common purpose, and that's to do harm to Israel. And so that's why the rabbis uh, distill the evil eye into what we would say are these two cousins of greed and destruction. We know that um, we, we keep going back to the garden for first examples of these things, covetousness. Well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil came to Eve's notice because it's described as nechmad, which is from Hamad, it's delightful. But if we remember what we've already been told about the trees in the garden, all the other permitted trees are nechmad. They're pleasant and delightful. The only difference between all the other pleasant and delightful trees and the tree that she coveted was that this particular tree did not belong to them. All the other trees of the garden did belong to the Adams family. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil did not belong to the Adams family. So when we covet the thing that is not ours, we tend to forget about all the wonderful, nechmad, delightful things he's already given us because we want that one thing that isn't ours. And we, we want it because it belongs to someone else. And where do we cross the line? when we begin obsessing about it, when we determine within ourselves that we are going to possess that thing at all costs. And so that obsession is the evil eye. A generous eye is glad when other people have blessings, when they enjoy success, when they enjoy favor, when they do well, the generous eye or the clear eye rejoices with them, as long as it's a good thing, as long as it's not an evil thing. But with an evil eye, when you look at someone else's favor or success, the, the tendency is to say, well, you know, I deserve that too. And remember, that was our lesson last week, where does offense live? 
It lives in the gap between what you believe you deserve or what you expected and what you actually received. And so we're still on topic. We've not really switched the topics. And Yeshua taught these topics. He taught them in Matthew and he taught in Luke. And he's going to link this evil eye to the watchfulness of the menorah and a faithful heart. Um, like shakad, the, the shakdim, the almonds that were hammered into the menorah, they look like eyes. They mean watchfulness, wakefulness. And the, the almonds are one of the first to bloom out in the spring. They're very quick. The idea of putting the almond blossoms into the menorah, it's, it's somebody that's going to be very quick to perform the commandments through the power of the Holy Spirit because they're wakeful, they're watchful, they're not asleep. More specifically, he's going to tell us that if you have this generous eye, which is the opposite of the evil eye, then you're going to have a heart that doesn't worry about food, drink, or clothing tomorrow. Now, it doesn't mean at all. I mean, we all think about it tomorrow. We do have to do a certain amount of preparation tomorrow, but it's knowing the definition of worry. There's a difference between preparing for tomorrow and worrying about it. There's a, there's a different intensity when we talk about worrying about tomorrow. But the question is, why do we covet? What makes this thing so delightful to us? Is it only that I look at it with my eyes and it's just so beautiful, I have to have it? Well, it might look that way on the surface, but Yeshua teaches the precept. And the way that he teaches about it is, he says that when you covet things, when you have an evil eye, it is because you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And because of this worry for your future, you act today. And so he's going to teach us that the root cause of this disease that's known as the evil eye, it even opens the door to demonic oppression. And so he teaches his disciples the antidote. And he says, rather than be like King Saul, remember who decides to consult a necromancer to try to, to conjure up the prophet Samuel. He says, we don't need to be consulting unbelievers. We don't need to be consulting necromancers, magicians, people who regularly uh, tap in to the power of death or live in a, in a state of uncleanness. We don't want to seek out information from these sorts of people. Even though we know that periodically we might have visitors from this realm of waterless places and where the Israelites at this point, without uh, Moses, without the rock, they are in a waterless place. There's only springs every so often and certainly not enough in those springs to supply water to all the Israelites. It had to be supernatural water in the wilderness. And so Yeshua wants us to understand the evil eye. So what is, is Strong's 4190, when we look at the evil, an evil eye, Ra, um, it's used 50 time, 51 times in English, simply is just evil. 10 times is wicked one. So it's a very consistent definition. I don't know that there's anything secret to unpack there. It just is very plain. So we want to look, if, if you're looking through your Bibles right now, we want to look at the passage in Matthew 6. And I broke 16 through 34, verses 16 through 34, into contrast verses about the evil eye. And I put it on a chart for you, which is different from the time that we learned it back in 2018, I think. I don't think I was using a PowerPoint at that time, and it's a little harder to visualize. So 
I put it on a chart to make it easy for you to see how these things work as Yeshua is teaching us about this evil eye. In the middle of the chart, it's more about behaviors and discerning whether this behavior is directing the object or the favor upon yourself or whether you are simply the instrument of directing the favor and the good feeling, the emotion, the glory, the credit, or whatever it may be, back toward heaven. You're directing it back toward the Holy One. And so I picked out the behaviors that Yeshua mentions. So he says, whenever you fast, if you're one of my disciples, if you have a good eye, he says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So he's saying there's things in your faith practice that you need to take special care that you're not putting out a, a press release when you decide to fast, unless you're fasting with a group, that, that would be a different thing. If you're signing up to fast with a group, then of course everybody's going to know about it that's on the list. But let's say this is something that you have taken up on yourself, a personal fast. Well, he's saying, don't, don't run around all gloomy, Gus, and looking like you're hungry and hollow-eyed and all this, so people will ask you about it so that you will receive attention for it. He says, just go on about your business. And these things that you do in private, because it's between you and the Father, it's not between you and the Father and somebody else, that he's going to reward you in that way. So the behavior is fasting and he's saying don't do religious things in order to be noticed when you do certain things the point should be to glorify Adonai now how does the evil eye approach a fast well he says don't do as the hypocrites do he says, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So the attention that they're seeking or the attaboys or girls that they're seeking for being pious and fasting, when they get those attaboys and girls, that's the reward. There's nothing beyond that. There's no eternal reward for doing religious acts for other people to notice and, and pat you on the back or to say nice things about you. But when you do what you do, such as a fast, and you don't do it to be noticed, you simply do it to increase your relationship and your relationship with the Father. Or if you do what you do, you do that thing to glorify Adonai. Let's say you give your testimony in public. This is not a private thing. Let's say you give a testimony, and that's what a testimony is. It's a public thing. Does the testimony bring attention to you, or does it bring attention to the power of the Father to bring you out of that catastrophe? And so we can give a testimony to be noticed, or we can give a testimony to hold up the power of Adonai. And Yeshua tells us the difference. He tells us we're going to have to choose what we treasure in the heart. And what we treasure, again, what have we coveted? What have we seen as pleasant, delightful, delectable, delicious? Is it the things on earth? Or is it the things that we know can pass into the kingdom after we die? Because he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you're looking at and what you're longing for, what you're coveting, 
or what you do simply see as desirable, let's say you are coveting a spiritual gift, but not because someone else has it and you want what they have, or you want to be somebody else, you want to be just like so-and-so. Um, again, what are you treasuring? Because Yeshua says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. That's important, that phrase, where thieves do not break in or steal. Because he likes this example in context. So he says, there's certain things that we can do that will bring forth good treasure for tomorrow. But it's not tomorrow here on earth. It's treasure for tomorrow in heaven. It's treasure for the kingdom. If you have the evil eye, he says, you store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves can break in and steal. That can be taken away from you. And we know that if you hoard, just like the manna, it'll turn to worms. You can't take more out of this life than what you can use or give away. Everything else will turn to worms. It'll be destroyed. And remember, that's what, exactly what Balak's name is, destroyer. And so what does the destroyer take from you? He can never take from you eternal things. He can only take from you the things that you have hoarded up because of the evil eye, whether it's literal goods or even whether it's the favor, whether it's the admiration of others. Like he's saying, the hypocrites, they want admiration. They want others to think that they're important. They want this favor. And once they pass on into the next life, that favor is just going to dissipate. It won't be there anymore. But if we're doing the things we do to honor the Father, then that reward will be waiting for you. The reward was not in this life. There might be some reward, there might be a natural result of good behavior in this life, but that's not the primary thing. The primary reward for deeds of righteousness that glorify Adonai, those things are waiting for us and they'll never grow old. They're eternal. And so Yeshua says, um, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if you have an evil eye, he says, if your eye is bad, that's one way of saying evil eye. If your eye is bad, ayin ra, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And we say, well, how in the world could light ever be dark? Well, we're, we're told how. Remember, the menorah represents the Holy Spirit that is in us. But... It also represents the Torah. Isaiah 8.20 says, uh, to the law, to the Torah, and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, if, if someone is not using the Torah to light their way in this world, they don't have light in them. And then he says, for the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life in Proverbs 6.23. So we know that the Torah is the light. So you as the human are the menorah of the Torah. And the whole point of that is to direct the attention to heaven, not to yourself. If somebody is looking at you and saying, what a wonderful light you are, then you need to redirect them and say what a wonderful light he is and what a wonderful light he has given us as a gift. And you can have this light too. But if you're allowing that to go on and people to heap favor upon you and admiration upon you and you're not redirecting it toward heaven, then you have to test and see if your eye is bad because you might be taking that clear light of the menorah 
and misusing it and taking that light. And then it becomes darkness because you're like the hypocrites that Yeshua is talking about who are doing what they do to be noticed by people. And he says, anything that you do to be noticed by people, that notice that you receive from them, that attention that you receive from them, that's it. That's all. But the, the reward of a mitzvah, the reward of a commandment, if it's for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the Father, for the sake of helping your brother, then don't expect that reward in this life. You might be, but the reward will be waiting on the other side. So that's what we're saying. If we present the Torah and make it something dark by enriching ourselves, by elevating ourselves to be noticed, then we have taken that great light of the word and made it into darkness in our lamp of the commandment keeping. And then Yeshua sums up this, uh, these two ways. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth or mammon. And so it's just, it's super easy. You're either doing what you're doing for the sake of the kingdom, or you're doing what you're doing for the sake of attention. And so we have Yeshua's statement about you can serve this or that. And when we look at greediness or stinginess, we say, okay, this is somebody who's serving Mammon. This God has a name, a God of wealth, but it's just serving yourself. It's serving your self will because really wealth is not an entity. It's not something outside of yourself. It is yourself. If you serve that God, Mammon, it's not something else that you can blame. You can say, oh, well, the God Mammon, he seduced me. Just like, well, the snake seduced me. No, that may have been the instrument, but it was yourself you wanted to serve because you coveted and you wanted more than you had been allotted by the Holy One. It's not wrong to be wealthy. How you use that wealth who it glorifies, that's what's important. So we know that with the Gentiles, they, they would each assign gods a dominion. They would be a god of, in every culture typically, a god of fertility, a god of the underworld. There might be gods of wine, rivers, oceans, commerce, heavenly bodies. Uh, Catholicism appropriated that practice and simply pinned saints' names onto those different entities. So now you can wear a, a saint whatever, and that's supposed to help you in business or whatever. Uh, a good example of that, if you're not familiar with, with Catholicism, sometimes it's uh, based in a particular, like uh, Louisiana was one place I lived where there were a lot of Catholics, and that was my first real experience with um, praying to saints because my friends were Catholic. Um, but I recently watched a, a good movie. It's called I Am David. And the little boy is introduced uh, to this idea that you could pay, pray to a particular saint, and then he would bless you in that particular area, like baking. Right. Not that I don't need help in baking, I do, but I'm not going to pray to some saint to help me bake a loaf of bread or whatever. So it's something that finds its way in unexpected places or should be unexpected. But what would happen, you could go to a particular God of that domain and pray to that God or make a sacrifice to that God. And then that God gives you what you want. 
that's different from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because when you serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he teaches you to accept what he assigns you without coveting what he gives to others, simply because they have it and you don't. Um, what did Paul say? I've learned that whatsoever state I'm in, there to be content. And so covetousness ultimately or the evil eye, it's worshiping, worshiping yourself as a god. So it doesn't matter if you call the god Mammon, Zeus, if you put your own first name in there. When you are covetous, you're serving yourself. You have elevated yourself to the level of God, which we saw last week in Korach, which we saw in Amalek. So saying Mammon or wealth, it's just really telling you it's a specific area of covetousness, wealth. We can also be covetous of knowledge. We can be covetous of sexual pleasure. Any delectable, desirable object can become the focus of our coveting. But Yeshua tells the disciples not to worry about tomorrow. Remember the interaction when he, he's telling them, I have to go, you're going to have to carry on the work. And, you know, according to the tradition, it's John, he's, he's pointing out saying, you know, John's still going to be alive when I come. Um, and he's telling the other disciples, don't worry about who's going to be doing what and, you know, what I've called this person to do and what I've called that person to do. You're 12 and I deal with each one of you individually. So don't compare yourselves to the others, which they were prone to do. They were, you know, seemed to be having these arguments all the time about who got to sit close to him, who was going to get to sit on what throne close to him. And he's telling, don't worry about what the other disciples are doing. Put your foot one in front of the other and listen to me. Don't covet something just because another disciple has it or might have it. Don't worry about it. And so he uses a chiasm in Matthew 6, 25 through 31, and he gives them matching pairs of ideas so that we can get right to the heart of what coveting is. He gives us the theme right at the center. And so I've got it broken down here on the chart for you. And so instead of reading it chronologically, we're going to read it chiastically. It says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Okay, we look at the other A statement down there at the bottom. It's bookend. So he says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? See how it matches up? So he's describing the things we worry about in life, food, drink, and clothing. And when we say clothing, we're saying in, in more cases than not appearance. Okay, our B statements. He says, look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So he gives an example from nature. Our other B statement. Observe the lilies of the field, how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and gone tomorrow, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So he's using two examples in the B statements of nature, the birds and the lilies of the field. He's, he's using food in reference to the birds 
And then he's using clothes or appearance in reference to the lilies of the field. And so that brings us to our axis or to our C statement that's at the heart of what he's trying to tell us with these examples about the food um, and the clothing and the drink. He says, and who of you by being worried about food, that's the context there, who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? So at the heart of it, it goes back to the food, the drink, and the clothing that we're worried about them. He's using specific wording. Why are you worried? So where does covetousness come from? It comes from worry. It comes from worrying about being fed and clothed tomorrow. Tomorrow. And how many tomorrows are we worried about? Well, because we do have a nefesh, a soul, and that soul is our life force that's put into us to keep us alive. That's why we have it in common with an animal. It's a very strong force. And so there is an aspect of being human where we should be preparing for the future. But we're not supposed to be worried about the future, being concerned about the future, being prepared for the future, that's not as extreme a tick as worry. Worry ticks you over into a realm where you're going to be vulnerable to covetousness. And that's what we keep seeing in the wilderness in reference to the water, in reference to the manna. They're worried about tomorrow. So what do they do? They hoard manna. They go out and they try to gather on the Sabbath day. They grumble and they complain about the water. And it's under control day by day in order to show them how they need to approach food, water, and clothing day by day. It's going to be taken care of day by day by the Father. When we worry, when we go into that extreme of worry about more than today, that's where we're in the, the coveting zone. Just like last week where we talked about a stumble. What would put you into a stumble, an offense? What puts you into the realm of danger of coveting? Going from preparation, which is normal, into a state of worry, which is covetousness, the danger zone. So he gives us the axis by teaching us in the chiasm. He fixes our attention on the core problem. He says the essence of the evil eye is worry. Specifically, that's the root cause of the evil eye. So when we worry about food, drink, and clothing, remember the uh, example he gave about the rich man who said, you know what, I don't have enough barns to hold all my stuff. I'm going to build new barns and I'll spend the rest of my life eating, drinking, and making merry. What does he intend to do? Just live off of his wealth and his prestige, which tells you he doesn't intend to do much more work. And he doesn't intend to share much. He just wants to build more barns to increase his um, economic security. And so we can be worried about economic security way beyond what is reasonable for a disciple. We can also be worried about clothing or appearance, how others perceive us way beyond what is appropriate for a disciple. In fact, if you expect others to favor you all the time, to think you're wonderful all the time, to think what a great scholar you are, or what a great tzaddik you are, well, you're, you're probably already over that line. Because Yeshua told us that people are going to make fun of us, they're going to mock us, they're going to do all sorts of things to us if we truly follow him. 
And so if we're worried about our appearance beyond covering ourselves, not just in, in earthly clothes, but in the robes of righteousness, taking on the righteousness of Yeshua, then we're probably already over in the realm of coveting. And that's why we want to be careful even how we do dress in the natural realm, that it's not drawing the wrong type of attention, that we're not being noticed for the wrong things. So again, worrying is our root cause. And he drops another clue in that axis. He's equating worrying as having little faith. How do I know I would have little faith if I'm worried about tomorrow's food, clothing, and drink? I'm like that rich man that wants to build new barns. I'm not going to depend upon Adonai to give me my daily bread for my you know, day to day. I don't trust him enough to take care of my future. Therefore, I think I must hoard up because I can't depend upon him. And of course, we know that the Ross the rust and the, the moth corrupt. The mildew can set in. Everything can be ruined overnight when we have little faith. Lack of faith leads to worry. Worry leads to covetousness. Covetousness leads to obsession. And these three general categories of food, drink, and your appearance. How you clothe yourself. And whether it's clothing yourself in the righteousness of Yeshua in order to do the works of Yeshua and to serve the Father and to glorify the Father, or whether you're trying to clothe yourself with deeds of Scripture so that you can be noticed and admired by other people. And that evil eye can lead you down a lot of other roads in terms of the things that you do cover, covet in this life. And so, which treasure should you covet? What's a, what's a good thing to desire? The treasures of the kingdom. If we earnestly desire the treasures of this earth above the treasures of the kingdom, that's fine. Yeshua says you have your reward. But you're not going to be able to take that with you. And we say that all the time. You can't take it with you. Well, sometimes we just use that as a justification for overspending. That's not what that means. You can take earthly deeds as a reward in this life. But when they are self-serving, when they don't bring glory to the kingdom, then they won't travel. They can't cross the river. And so he's telling us that the father's able to clothe his children with more honor and with more beauty than anything we could covet like Bilam. Because remember that evil eye is nearsighted. It only sees earthly things. If it does see something heavenly, unless there's divine intervention like there was in this Torah portion with Bilam where he is forced to prophesy accurately of Israel, even though it's inaccurate in the earthly realm, they are not all those beautiful things that he prophesies, but he sees them as they will be. So typically the evil eye is nearsighted. It sees earthly things, but it rarely considers, is this earthly thing I'm coveting, is it truly a tool to increase the kingdom? Because that's where we'll tend to do mental gymnastics and try to twist something into something that, oh, I need to do this, or I need to be this, or I need to buy this, because it's going to be for the kingdom. Uh, you know, you may have done that before. You saw something you wanted to buy, and you said to yourself, well, if I buy this expensive tool, or if I buy this expensive gadget, then I'm going to save this much money. It's going to pay me back in a year's time if I just buy this thing. And then what you find out is you stick the thing out in the garage on a shelf because in the moment you were caught up with coveting that delightful thing. And then we end up with garages full of things that we rarely, if ever, use and end up in a garage sale because we were nearsighted.
And so because we were nearsighted, we allowed ourselves to twist uh, how we would use this thing. We said, oh, it'll be to save money. That's not what it was for at all. It was just to satiate that covetous appetite. And so there's things we can convince ourselves that they're for the kingdom, but the Father knows whether his glory or not. And so Yeshua summarizes the teaching in verses 32 through 34 with this, this contrast here. Again, contrasting the good eye and the evil eye. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, if it's for his glory and his kingdom and his righteousness first, then all these other things are going to take care of themselves because, remember, there's three things that a husband cannot um, decrease, according to the Torah, from his wife. And those three things are food, coverings, and the ona, or sexual relations, is how it's, it's usually translated, her time. It literally means time of intimacy. Those three things can never be diminished according to the Torah. And if he diminishes her in the food, the clothing, or the covering, and the marital obligation, then basically he is stealing from that relationship. And so if he expects a human husband never to diminish those three obligations, then how much more, to use Yeshua's phr phrasing, does the Father in heaven always ensure that we will be fed, that we will be covered or clothed, and that he will always be available for those times of intimacy and prayer? That he will give us of his time. If, if that's what we seek, that's why we seek his kingdom and his righteousness. We want to be intimate with him. But he says the Gentiles seek all these things, these earthly things, the, the earthly food, the earthly clothing and favor, the, the earthly um, sexual appetite. The Gentiles, he says, they're seeking those things, but not in reference to his kingdom and his righteousness. But he says, your heavenly father knows you need all these things. So oh. he to supply them. So he's saying, how do you guard against the evil eye? How do you maintain the good eye, the watchful eye, the clear eye of the menorah? He says, you're going to have to guard and manage how you care for things, and specifically these things, food, drink, and appearances. Um, be careful that your desire to be chamud to others, to make sure that you're personally uh, of value to others, and, and we see a lot of that where people are working very hard to gain the favor of others. We, we gauge our success in life by how many likes or thumbs ups we might have on Facebook or little hearts or how many things we've put in Twitter that are retweeted around the world or how many times something is shared. Uh, we start measuring ourselves or our success by those appearances when if we really get right down to the nitty gritty how many of those people even know us personally all they know is what they see on facebook maybe or through limited social contact but they don't really know us they don't really have a relationship with us and so we've become more concerned about the appearance of an of a relationship than with the relationship itself. And the internet has made that possible for us to have relationships that aren't really relationships. And therefore you get all these young people, especially who are becoming so depressed when the wolves move in on, on social media. And it's all based on relationships that are not relationships. They may not even know the people who are sniping at them. And, um, 
challenging them on social media. But see, in our minds, just like when you watch a movie, you know the responses in your brain put you in the situation as if you are there. It doesn't really know how to make that distinction emotionally. And so it's the same way with social media. Children get on there and use it. Well, adults do too. We get on Facebook and we get our feelings hurt or we become exhilarated. Those things are available. So we need to be careful how we manage those things that we don't replace real relationships with those things. Because trying to seek after favor of appearances, that clothing, the way that we appear to other people, it really is being worried about tomorrow. Why do we want the group to think we're important? Why do we want our social groups to think we have worth? Because it's a survival skill. There's safety in the group. And if the group loves me today, then maybe they'll love me tomorrow and they'll take care of me tomorrow. I'll still be important tomorrow. We don't consider what's really at the root, worry of coveting the favor of others. So the safety of the group is not what offers us true security. It's the, it's the security of heaven, of our heavenly father. So Yeshua says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So he's saying in the same way the Israelites were not allowed to hoard their daily manna, we are not supposed to worry about tomorrow. The Father is going to supply us with food, drink, and clothing. And it's going to be even more glorious and even more precious and delectable and desirable than the food, the drink, and the clothing or the, the social protection that we go around coveting. Because what he teaches is that today's favor, we might find out is eternity's contempt. Worrying about tomorrow is to worry about earthly things. Preparing for tomorrow is to ready yourself for heavenly things. Like I would say, learn to distinguish between the two things. Worrying is attached to earthly things. Preparing is attaching to heavenly things. And so we might use earthly things to prepare for tomorrow, heavenly things. The evil eye is going to appear to be concerned about the future. But its true character is living for today, living in the moment. That's what animals do. They live in the moment. So seeking the kingdom of heaven and the Father's righteousness that we they read about in the Torah, that we practice from the Torah, if we are doing those things for the service of others, that's farsighted. That's preparing for tomorrow. But if you worry with the evil eye, then Yeshua says, guess what? You'll never run out of things to worry about because every single day is going to bring its trouble. Um, I don't recommend turning on the news first thing every day, unless that's just, you know, the day that you pick or the part of the day that you pick to update yourself. Uh, but if that's the way that you start the day, as opposed to prayer, then it's going to offer you a new trouble every day. It'll offer you something to become worried about because you will begin coveting your future safety. You'll begin coveting safety for your children, for your grandchildren. And he says, I've got enough for today. I want you to prepare for tomorrow by being concerned with the things of the kingdom. Because if you're constantly exposing yourself to the worry, of the evil eye, you're going to shorten your spiritual vision, and that's when you take the snake's eye view. And that's going to be when you end up with very little treasure after death and resurrection. So look at this from Proverbs. This is an interesting proverb, Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. It says, go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer or ruler, 
prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. In other words, nobody's standing over her making her work. She willingly goes about her business without being told. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Well, here's what we know about the ant. The ant lives only six months, but she harvests all the food that she possibly can in her lifetime, not so she can eat it. She harvests for the next generation to enjoy what she has gathered. And so human beings, the same way. Yeshua says, gather with me. So in fact, he says, if you don't gather with me, you're scattering. Human beings are supposed to gather food with Yeshua that they're not going to enjoy in this life. We can only see it as something that could be fully rewarded and enjoyed after the resurrection of the dead. Because when you see this language of sleep, slumber, and so forth, um, it's a metaphor of death. Right? When will you arise from your sleep? When will you resurrect? And so he's saying there's some things you're only going to be able to enjoy them after the resurrection of the dead. You're gathering, you're harvesting, and the expectation, because we're human, is there should be some payoff for this. I should be getting something back instead of getting, you know, it's just like one good deed breeds 100 curses sometimes. That's okay. That's the earthly snake level vision. That's at the, the level of the fallen, where we're stuck with the other dead people. But at the resurrection of the dead, we'll be able to stand fully upright and completely see how we've been working in the kingdom that all this time we were working in the kingdom. And so hoarding up earthly treasure is like a spiritual sleep, except at the resurrection of the dead, you wake up to find out you're poverty stricken. You might have owned mansions. You might have been a billionaire in this life. But if it wasn't to glorify the kingdom, then you were spiritually asleep. And so you're left with the covetousness that now it says uh, your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. In other words, your wealth will instantly become poverty once you cross in to that realm after death. And so remember what Yeshua says was the root cause of evil eye. Worry worry, worry. You don't have to be rich or successful to be covetous. You don't have to be poor to be covetous. All you have to do is worry excessively and daily about the things that the Father has provided so far. Covetousness comes from worry and worry comes from lack of faith. And so when we look at the, the giving that the Israelites did to build the Mishkan, they had left as a nation of slaves. They had been living in poverty and all of a sudden they're full of wealth. And on this particular wonderful day, they didn't hoard. They didn't say, well, we might need this stuff to trade for the future. No, they just started giving out of their hearts for the building of the Mishkan. They were holding on to it for when we get there. And they kept giving to the point that Moses had to tell them to stop. Why? Because in this moment of inspiration, they became very faithful people. They quit worrying about tomorrow. So Yeshua says in Luke eleven thirty four, the eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is also full of darkness. If we look at the full context of that statement of Luke 11, 14 through 36, Yeshua links the evil eye contextually with information about demons, 
which again is also recognized by the pagan religions. We know that Balak and Balaam were tapping in or trying to tap into demonic forces. And so I suggest after class this week, if you have time, go ahead and, and take in that whole chapter for full context so that you can see how it's, again, by smichut, we see how the evil eye is connected to the demonic realm. Remember how Mishle said poverty comes like an armed man when it speaks of the ants. So it says he was casting out a demon and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. There's the destroyer. Remember the prophecy of Bilam when he looks out and he sees the tents? How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. He's seeing a house that is not divided, that is united. So Yeshua knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. That's how Balak, the destroyer, can come in. A house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, this is a, a verse that's often quoted out of context and used out of context. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions, and I want you to think here, heavenly possessions, are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So we have a context. He's, he's been describing the evil eye or covetousness for the treasures of the earth. And then he's casting out demons. And then he's charged with say, well, you might be casting out demons, but you're doing it by sorcery, like Bilam, through Beelzebub. And then Yeshua points out how ridiculous that accusation is. If he was working for the kingdom of darkness, then why would he be doing something to weaken the kingdom of darkness? He would be doing something instead to weaken the kingdom of heaven. He would be trying to do things against Israel, not to heal them, not to build them up. We don't win the war by working for the other side. And so he goes on and he explains. He says there's a, a need for us to be strong and fully armed in order to protect our own house so that it remains undisturbed. And remember, a house is a metaphor for the body of a human being. And then Yeshua uses an important word, guards. And remember the menorah. It's decorated with almond blossoms. And the root of almond, shakad, it means to protect, to be wakeful, to be watchful. So he says, this is the element that you need to be strong and watch over your house, your own body. You have to be wakeful, be watchful. You can't be like the sluggard that can't even learn from the ant. He spiritually falls asleep because he's only thinking about today and earthly things, but he's not thinking about tomorrow and heavenly things. 
So the Holy Spirit has to be that force to empower the strong man. So you can be watchful and guard your house. Otherwise, this unclean spirit can capitalize on your evil eye. It can overpower you. And he's saying how, does, how it happens. When you lay up treasures because you're worried about things. Remember, worry is more extreme than being prepared. Joseph prepared. Joseph didn't worry. Joseph prepared. He knew exactly what to do. So covetousness derives from worry about future security. And so he says, if you're practicing the evil eye, you're living in a state of worry, then those very things that you're worried about can be plundered and then they'll be redistributed to, to others, right? And so it could even be redistributed to others who also have the evil eye. Or if we think about kingdom opportunities, when you spend so much time worried about earthly things that you don't really have time for heavenly things, for tomorrow, the true tomorrow, then he might take an opportunity that could have been yours, that you were gifted to work in, he might take that spiritual opportunity away from you and redistribute it to someone who has a more generous heart. He will redistribute it to somebody who will accept that responsibility. And um, so it's with the evil eye that we kind of help the unclean spirit to build the kingdom of darkness. So you could have been a strong man, but when you quit watching, when you quit moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and you began worrying about tomorrow, you lost your treasure because you started accumulating the wrong kind of treasure. And you, get, you open the door for an unclean spirit to come in. And it's not just that your treasure's gone. Uh, it's that now you have uninvited guests, guests you didn't really want because this unclean spirit has been attracted to this house full of treasure. When the unclean spirit sees a house full of treasure that's not being distributed for the sake of the kingdom, that's not being used for the sake of the kingdom, that's how the unclean spirit knows, hmm, I could find a home here because this person is covetous, because this person is worried about not tomorrow so much as today how to serve myself today. They, they don't understand what tomorrow is. And that's why an unclean spirit does not have to be omniscient like the Holy One. If you want to get the attention of an unclean spirit and his seven friends who are worse than himself, then what you need to do is start parading all your treasure and success before others. That's all you need to do. And where do we tend to post those sorts of things? Where do we tend to put up the parade? Social media. You can see that this is almost uniquely uh, the trap of the generation. Uh, we have more access to luxury goods that we can parade in front of other people. Not that people haven't always wanted to show off nice clothes. Not that people haven't always wanted to throw big parties and to show off how much money they had. Not that people haven't always wanted people to look at their accomplishments. They have. But in this generation, uniquely, we have the power to reach so many more people not understanding that there's way more than interested friends and family members when we parade our wealth, when we parade our success. And so we're dangling demon bait when we do that. If we are like the hypocrite and we are parading self-righteousness to be seen of others, it's demon bait. He knows the door's cracked at least. And so humans who troll the internet will see those successes we'll see those 
methods we use of drawing attention to ourselves, the crazy stuff that we'll post just to get somebody to share it and repost it. It's not just our friends and family who are taking note of that. There's all sorts of things and people out there who are taking note of that. If you're posting your vacation videos from some exotic, wonderful place halfway around the world, it's, it may not be just your friends and family who notice that. It might be the local thief who will come and clean out your treasure because you wanted to, you know, do your selfie stick all over the Caribbean. It happens every day. You advertise uh, so that people will notice. Now, can you lock that down where it is just your friends and family? I would. I wouldn't be out there telling people when I was on a long vacation uh, if I didn't have somebody at home who could guard my house. And so it's even in the, the earthly realm, you can see the spiritual principle. When you're out there flaunting your successes, so other people will notice, you need to guard your heart and say, no, wait a minute, let me walk humbly. What, is he, what does he require of me to walk humbly with him? That's what I need to do. And so... That's always a challenge when you have a ministry, how much, um, how much do you want to be seen? And for what reason? Uh, that's, a, that's a constant balancing act. And it's the same way in your life. There are certain things you're gonna have to constantly walk that balancing act to figure out, am I doing this to get people to look at me and to praise my success? Or am I actually doing this to glorify the Father? And to equip myself to meet those needs that he's put in front of me. Um, you know, it, the unclean spirits, we tell them where we are when we're in a state of vulnerability. Just like if you're walking down the street and you see somebody who's dressed flashly, flashy and provocatively in order to make people look at them, well, we know what's going on there. And, and that's the trouble. When we try to redirect eyes to us, we don't realize that we are directing also evil eyes to us who would like to destroy us or who will look at us and then who will in turn begin to covet what we have. Sometimes that's gonna happen anyway. But there's things that we can do in terms of modesty so that we're not drawing undue attention to ourselves for the wrong reasons. We have to walk in humility so that we don't become vulnerable to the evil eye and that so we don't provoke it unnecessarily in others. And I say it'll, it'll happen anyway. People will be jealous of you at some point in your life. They will be covetous of the things that you have at some point in your life because it's very human to want the things we can't have or that someone else has. But we don't have to taunt them and to invite them to open that door up and make themselves vulnerable. And this would be a good uh, point to close out on. <coughs> it says, well, Yeshua was saying these things one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast of which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Now, that's not just a strange, rude interruption to Yeshua's teaching. He uses it in order to make the point. Going back to his statement about casting out demons by the finger of God. The finger of God is a very specific statement. The first mention of the finger, in God, finger of God is going to be in regard to Pharaoh's magicians because they can't conjure up a plague to mimic Moses. In Exodus 8.18, it says they tried with their secret arts, the magicians did, to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this 
is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So, Yeshua redirects. It, it goes back to here. There are certain things that are going to be the finger of God. It's, it's not tapping in to unclean demonic realms. It's coming from above the finger of God. And the demonic realm cannot mimic it. Remember, you keep testing to figure out whether you're, you're hearing from an apostle <laughs> or a magician. And until you find out, you have to keep testing. But there comes a point where you say, you know what, this is the finger of God because a magician couldn't do this. A dark force could not do this. We don't wanna be confused by signs and wonders. But Yeshua, remember when they accused him of casting out demons with the power of Beelzebub. He says, by what power do your sons cast out demons? He says, for they will be your judges. So you ask yourself, what's the antecedent there? Does he mean their sons will be the judges or the demons themselves? Well, that first mission passage that we read clarifies the answer. It was the magicians themselves who judged between their own dark power and Moses. The magicians had to admit that Moses' power was the finger of God. He wasn't tapping into the same force. So in its first mention, that's what the finger of God does. It distinguishes between the power of heaven and the power of demonic forces. Yeshua identifies himself with the finger of God not with the prince of darkness. So if you harden your heart against the finger of God, uh, then you're going to harden yourself against his commandments. You're hardening yourself against the word of God. We know Yeshua is the word of God. That's what John tells us. So we have two more mentions of the finger of God. And it's associated with the Ten Commandments that were written on the tablets. It says in Exodus 31, 18, that the tablets of testimony were written by the finger of God. And it's repeated in Deuteronomy 9, 10, that the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God. What is Yeshua saying? He's saying, the finger of God is going to testify to my power that I am speaking according to the power of the word of God. But whatever you're doing, it's also going to testify against you that you've tapped into a different source, that your light has become darkness because it's for a self-serving reason. And that's what we know Moses said about the 10 words. He says, it's not an idle, for, idle word for you, it's your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land. And then we have the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel come in and they prophesy of a day when the Torah is going to be written upon the tablets of Israel's transformed heart. And Yeshua is bringing all these contexts in. Remember, it's Jewish listeners. And so he's advocating like Jeremiah and Ezekiel who talk about the new covenant, which is actually a renewed covenant that is going to be written on hearts of flesh. Those will become the tablets for the 10 words written by the finger of God. And it's going to happen through a transformation of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33, where he talks about this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my Torah within them and on their heart. I will write it. His finger, as originally written. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's Ezekiel 36, 27. So the original Torah is written by the finger of God. The renewed covenant is also a work of the spirit of God. 
his finger. And Yeshua is establishing this authority of the Holy Spirit as he's casting out demons that are seeking to take the very lives of the Israelites and possess their houses. And he's saying, what is the antidote to this demonic possession? What is the antidote to this unclean house? He says, it's the word. It's this new covenant. So when this lady pronounces a blessing upon Yeshua's earthly mother for nursing him, she gives him the opportunity to clarify how you keep your house protected and your spiritual armor strong. He's saying you have to grow up. Nursing is fine for a season of childhood, but you have to grow up and be watchful with the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to be watchful against demonic activity. And that's what Yeshua says when she blesses his mother, he says, on the contrary. He says, those who hear the word and observe it are the ones who are blessed. Those are the strong ones who can be watchful over their own houses. They can guard against covetousness. They can guard against worry. And all these things that would open the door to unclean things. They can protect their spiritual treasures for eternity. Not the treasures of the evil eye, but the treasures that they have gained through their generosity of spirit. Psalm 131.2 says, Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. And remember, your soul is your appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. Those things that get involved in coveting and worrying. So the weaned child, it says, is going to be quietly composed and rest against his or her mother. The woman or the wise woman in scripture is frequently going to be a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. So the weaned child, the child that is maturing, is now leaning on the Holy Spirit, becoming stronger, becoming more self-disciplined. It's becoming disciplined not to crave the milk of the word when it is time to grow up and demonstrate the strength and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And Isaiah explains it in 11.8. He says, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. So there's two different stages. One's a nursing child, one's a weaned child. The nursing child, he says, will play by the hole of the cobra. But the weaned child is stronger. She can actually put her hand on the viper's den and it's not going to injure her, which helps us recall what Yeshua said. You're going to be able uh, to take up serpents and it's not going to hurt you because you're not going to be tempted to fall down to the level of the serpent and to see life that way. The serpent's bite is not going to have any sting. The death is going to have no victory over the weaned child. Because we know the woman's seed, Yeshua crushed the head of the serpent. And he's going to return dominion over the creation to the woman who lost it at the restoration of all things. A nursing child doesn't always get all those things because it's still dependent. In fact, the nursing child, where it says it plays, uh, back here it says it plays by the hole of the cobra. Well, Sha'ah, Strong's 8173, to play, it also means to be smeared over or to be blinded, to look upon with complacency, to amuse yourself. Uh, and it can be in a negative sense. Or to cry out in confusion. Um, which takes us to Corinthians 13, 11. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so what this nursing child is doing is it's self-playing beside this realm of death is re represented by the snake. He might even amuse himself 
with the word or become confused by it in his childish understanding because there's still a smearing over or a blindness associated with playing like a child. And so he's saying what we see in these two children, the nursing child and then the wean child, is that this disciple is going to grow up from foolish understanding, from confusion, from blindness, from being smeared over, and instead he's going to grow into a weaned child. He's going to come into the kingdom like that little child. He's going to grow up. He's going to be strong to where that, that cobra no longer has the power to intimidate the child. And, and so we do. We have to grow up. We have to increase our understanding. We have to get rid of these spiritual cataracts to grow in spiritual strength and authority. We, we have to quit self-playing around the cobra holes because the cobra will eventually be attracted to all that babble he's hearing. He'll come on out to see what's going on. Rather than playing around the cobra holes and doing a lot of babbling, we need to be weaned. We need to be strong where the viper's not even going to stick his head out of the hole. We need to start controlling the serpent with good understanding of the word, speaking mature words, and being generous of heart. And Yeshua is going to establish us in that maturity and hearing the word and observing it. And when you hear the word and observe it, he says, it's a demon buster. The, the snake doesn't even want to fight. Matthew 13, 52, he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So he's re reiterating the scribe, lest we paint all the scribes with one brush and say they were all hypocrites. Uh, no. He says, this is the type of scribe you need to be. You need to know the word, become skilled in the word. And he says, when you do that, you're like the head of a household and you're going to be able to bring those treasures out of the world, word, new and old, and you can defend the house. And I thought it was uh, maybe not so coincidentally that our Bibles are divided into the Tanakh, what Christians call the Old Testament, and the Habri Chadasha, the New Testament. We have treasures new and old. And so we can bring forth whatever we need from either of those testaments whenever we're challenged by a snake, whenever we're challenged by worry, whenever we're challenged by covetousness. It's not enough just to sweep the house clean. We have to start learning, hearing, and obeying the word and fill the house with good treasure that we can bring forth as armor. Because in a house like that, an unclean spirit or a demon, they're just never going to feel at home. The only way an unclean spirit or a demon could feel at home in a house full of the treasure of the word is if it was also filled with hypocrisy. If that light of the Torah was being misdirected to the house, to the individual, rather than giving light to the world. So... We want to watch out for two types of evil eye, worry and covetousness, like Bilam, or destruction, like Balak. And what destruction's tactic was, what Balak's tactic was, is he hired Bilam. So destruction hired worry. Destruction hired covetousness to get the job done. And so if you start to feel worried, if you feel like you're, you're moving beyond being concerned for the future and your preparation for the future, which is, you know, godly and normal. And if the needle's moving toward worry, and you say, if I'm excessively worried, then I'm also moving into a place where covetousness can move in. Then you just need to say, I'm not worried. 
In Hebrew, for a male, you would say, Ani lo doeg. Ani lo doeg. If you're female, you say, Ani lo doeget. Ani lo doeget. And you know what that translates to? Not just, I am not worried. It translates to, I am not doeg. And who is doeg? You can read about doeg in 1 Samuel 21.7. 1 Samuel 22.9, you can read that whole chapter. 1 Samuel 22.18, 1 Samuel 22.22, 22. those are the verses where he's named by name. And Psalm 52.1. Doeg literally means worry. And so when you say, Ani la doeg, you're saying, I am not doeg. I am not worried. And this would be your homework, right? So those of you that need to go, I know we've gone long, um, you can go, but I'll keep the recorder going so you can hear the homework when you listen to the recording. But I want you to take a look at all these verses that mention Doeg, which means you're gonna have to read 1 Samuel 21 and 22, because Doeg was the Edomite who was Saul's chief shepherd. And he's the one who saw David when he was on the run from Saul and he tattletailed to King Saul. And as a result of his tattletailing, he slaughtered 85 priests. So we see the, the end result of worry and how the destroyer can employ worry. How the destroyer saw employed the egg, the worrier. Worry doesn't seem like it's, it's that malicious. It can be. And so as you go through these verses, I want you to substitute for the name Doeg, worry, like this. Now, one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Worry, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherd. Now, as you go through these verses, when you substitute the word worry, I want you to find a study partner or partners, and I want you to discuss how that changes your reading, not really changes it, how it enhances your reading of that verse. Like with this first one. His name was Worry the Edomite. What do you know about the Edomite? Edom represents the nefesh, appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. Worry the appetite. Worry about the intellect. Worry emotions. And who was in charge of Saul's sheep? He put the worrier over his sheep. So the sheep were going to be at the mercy of worry, of the emotions of the nefesh. And you can, you can expand on that. I'm, I'm not going to say too much because I want you to take that down the trail of when worry is the shepherd and the chief shepherd. Because we know who the chief shepherd of the sheep is. But what happens when you put worry in charge? And then the next verse. What did worry the Edomite do? He said... What does worry say? Um, the next one. The king said to Doeg, you turn around and attack the priest. What happens when worry attacks? And by the way, he killed 85 priests. If you look at that in Hebrew and assign the gematria value to 85, it spells peh for mouth. What does worry do? One thing it does, it starts running its mouth. 
It's a tattletale. Right? And in the next one, you see it again. Worry the Edomite was there and he would surely tell Saul. Right? And then the last one, the Psalm 52, 1, you'll see a contrast there. Because this is written when Doeg, worry, the Edomite came and told Saul. He did it again, he told. Uh, and so Psalm is, is recalling this. But what does David proclaim? Worry doesn't seem to remember that the loving kindness of God endures all day long. So I've given you some homework to do, some study things you can do that I think are much more fun with a partner, with a friend, because you can, once you substitute worry in there for doeg, then I think it'll teach us over the, this coming week how much we need to watch out for those times when we're tempted to substitute worry for prayer. And so many times we do substitute worry for prayer. We speak to everyone, but to the Holy One, just like we said last night, where did Moses mess up? He could have taught the people to speak to the rock. He could have taught them to pray in a time of worry. And instead, he used the staff. Because I think he was a little worried himself. <laughs> so um, we can learn from these things. And I just wanted to remind you, too, that um, I do have Revive this coming weekend. And as far as I know, everything will be normal Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but watch your email because I have now consolidated your invitations. So you're going to get two invitations on one email. So you're free to join either or both of the classes. Uh, the only time that would be a problem is if some, for some reason we maxed out at 100, then I'd have to sort you back into to different classes again because our plan doesn't go above that or we'd have to upgrade our plan. Um, so just, uh, I didn't want you to miss it because the Tuesday class is second on the email and you may not notice the difference. And also notice that um, I'm gonna put the link into the entire private playlist and try to use that instead of repasting um, new links each week. It'll be easier if you can just click on it once and then it'll open everything up for you on YouTube. Um, but you'll still get your download links as well, okay?